anyway, it's great to be here. This is so much fun. And thank you to John, our favorite impresario. So I'm going to tell you how you can make a complete interactive application using GPT. And this is joint work um, with a wonderful undergraduate researcher in my group, Abu Talib Namazov, who is sitting right there uh, in his uh, purple uh, hoodie. So um, here is a question uh, that I saw on, uh, on Reddit a while ago. So this person says, is it possible for non-technical people to actually build an app using ChatGPT? And you don't need to go and check the Reddit thread because I can tell you what the answer is in many, many posts and many words, the answer is no. Uh, you can't actually do that. And you can't even do that now. You couldn't do it a year ago when this was posted and you can't do it now. Um, and this is something we're trying to change. And this is actually the challenge that's at the, uh, at the root of our research project. So you might say, well, why do you even need GPT? Why aren't there all these low-code app, low-code builders, you know, that allow you to build apps without writing code? And there are, and they're pretty fantastic, actually. This is um, a screenshot of an Airtable app that I made. We had the great privilege in my synagogue of hosting an Afghan refugee family, and we put together, I put together this Airtable app to essentially schedule and arrange all the volunteer activities, you know, to take them on trips and to take them shopping and get them food and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we built this app, and it was really cool, and it didn't take an enormous amount of time to build. Um, and it's really great for what they call CRUD, you know, create, read, update, delete, basic sort of database-like operations. But the problem is, the actual underlying sort of database query language is pretty limited because it's designed to be very simple. So it turned out, for example, that on the, on the volunteer form, you couldn't even make a form in which a volunteer gave their name and it matched it against a list of existing names. That was actually beyond the power of this system, which is kind of surprising. Um, and the other thing is you couldn't add very custom behaviors. You know, you could, tweak the, you could tweak all kinds of things, but you can't make it fundamentally behave in a different way because it's basically an app that just takes in data and puts out data. So what about, um, what about this? What about LLM, you know, um, you know, cool GPT, you know, and so on based autocoders, you know, like GitHub's Copilot? So this is the hottest stuff and programmers are very excited about this. And, you know, there's great news about this. It seems that this can roughly double the productivity of programmers. <coughs> Um, and essentially, it's kind of like a sort of super auto-completion. As someone describes it, it's a better tab button. You press the tab button in, you know, in, your, in your integrated development environment, and it doesn't just give you the next word. It fills in the entire function for you. And very often, it fills it in correctly. So this is super cool. Um, the problem with this is you can't actually build a whole app with this. You still need to decide which files you're going to write, what you're going to put in those files, how they're all going to connect together, and so on. <coughs> So here's a way to think about the problem of building apps by, by sort of thinking about apps in two different dimensions. So one dimension is what I call algorithmic complexity. That's basically, you know, how complicated the underlying algorithms are. Are you doing, are you doing real math? That kind of stuff. And the other dimension is interactional complexity. And that's the stuff we're more familiar with apps. All the to and fro between different human beings, all the coordination, um, all the sort of complexity of behavior. And so if we... Um, if we sort of look at this spectrum, we can place sort of different types of apps uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this grid. So imagine something like a tic-tac-toe generator, a tic-tac-toe player, or a, a generator that generates you know, a new quote every day, or a to-do app. These are in that corner that are sort of pretty simple in both dimensions. And then you have things that are high in algorithmic complexity. Think of something that calculates, you know, given the total principal in a mortgage and the number of years you're going to pay off and the interest rate, what the monthly payment will be. So there are lots of useful sort of data science-y things like this, Sudoku solvers, password guesses, and so on. And then things that have high interactional complexity but very low algorithmic complexity, those are actually most of the apps we're familiar with. Things like calendars and email clients and maybe home automation you know, systems. These things don't have to do elaborate calculations, but there are a lot of moving parts in how they work. And then finally, of course, there are the things that have high algorithmic complexity and high interactional complexity. Um, those are apps that's going to take a while to build using GPT. Those are things like, you know, Photoshop and InDesign and, you know, Microsoft Word, video conferencing systems, and so on. <clears throat> now, I'm really interested in that blue category in the top left. And the reason I'm interested in that is because there are so many apps that people want to build in that category. And they shouldn't be that hard to build. So our Airtable app was in that category. And in my own department and lab, we actually have someone whose job is to build these apps. And she's an amazing programmer, but it's insane how much work is involved here. And she's built 
dozens of apps, I would say, and they include all the apps we use to like manage our, you know, graduate admission day, uh, you know, for faculty progress reporting, what else, event calendars, uh, you know, student progress, teaching assignments, all these kinds of things. They're all written by hand in Ruby on Rails. They're a massive amount of work to produce. So the question that I pose is, is there some way of basically generating all the apps in that blue category completely automatically? So here's an example of an app that it really should be possible to generate automatically. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't resist including a discussion from Hacker News about, uh, about my dad's work, which was an approach to, uh, to, building, uh, to building apps that is now uh, quite old, but was pretty cool back then. Um, so Hacker News is a really popular forum, um, probably the most popular forum where hackers discuss new ideas in programming and software development and so on. When you see this <coughs> website, you don't need to learn how to use it. And the reason for that is that in some sense, like a lot of social media websites, there's nothing new here, right? So you'll eventually figure out when you've played with this, you know, for a minute or two, that, let's see if I can get this to work, uh, that thing up there at the top is a post. And these things at the bottom, <coughs> underneath it, are comments on that post. We've seen posts and comments before, right? Um, this thing over in the, um, right hand side, I've got a really big lag here. How can I get this to work? Shake it, talk to it. Okay, press it harder, there you go. So you see the login button, and you know what that means. You know there's some kind of notion of a user session, right? Uh, because we're familiar with that, right? You see that this, that this post has 106 points, so you understand there's some kind of upvoting mechanism. And there you can see, if I bring up a user, you can see this user has some number of karma points. How do we know what karma points are? Well, because if you use Stack Overflow, you would know that karma is basically a measure, a sort of good citizen activity. And by accruing karma points, you're allowed to do new stuff. So you might ask the question, so if Hacker News is basically just a collection of familiar concepts, why did anyone have to build it at all? Why didn't you just take something you know, completely standard off the shelf? And the answer is because it embodies what Margaret Bowden, in a classic paper about creativity, described as combinational creativity. And that means, in short, that what Hacker News did, like a lot of applications, is to take old familiar ideas, but put them together in a new way with interesting twists. And those twists for Hacker News include, for example, the fact that a post in Hacker News you know, unlike you know, what you could produce in Facebook or Twitter or whatever, is actually just a URL or sometimes just, just a title and URL. The home page only lists posts that are up to four days old and after that they're cleared away. The comment concept has these weird rules, but very helpful rules, that you can delete a comment so long as you do it within two hours of creating the comment. And there are no new comments allowed on a thread after two weeks. And so all this contributes to making Hacker News a very live and up-to-date kind of site. The upvote concept actually includes a downvote action, but in order to prevent trolls from coming onto the website and trashing everything, downvote is only accessible when you've actually been granted a certain number of karma points. And you get those by, doing, by having good behavior, by posting things, for example, that get upvoted, or by upvoting other people's stuff. And then finally, there's this weird stuff in Hacker News to encourage people to distinguish between asking interesting questions and showing shamelessly showing stuff that they've made, that if you put a prefix, ask Hacker News or show Hacker News before your title, it will route it to do two different places and allow people to then look essentially at two different sub-forums for those different kinds of contributions. So this is all really cool, but it actually makes it much harder to build something like Hacker News because you need, you can't take just these standard concepts, you need somehow to be able to tweak them to produce all these specialized behaviors. So I'm gonna show you how, how that can be done. So here's the basic idea. So the basic idea is to employ the normal kind of you know, thing that everybody does with LLMs, which is that you basically take an informal description of what you want, you know, the, the, how you want the software to behave as a prompt. You feed it to GPT, and it gives you code. Okay, but that's not enough. We're going to need to have some structure here if we're going to build a whole app. And so the way this works is, first of all, we're going to break this down into, into the individual concepts. So the concepts are things like the concept of posting, of commenting, of karma, of users, of sessions, of uh, all these things, upvoting. And each one of them will have its own little description. And from that little description, GPT will create an implementation just of that concept, reusable in different applications. And then the user is going to describe something called a route, which is essentially going to be the 
the action that will actually be provided at the front end. So that might be something like add a comment. And that, that route is going to need features, actions from multiple uh, different uh, concepts. And in order to do that, it's actually, we're actually going to use GPT to extract from that concept code a description of the API, a specification of the API, so that this, this route, when the code is generated, can actually use the comment code. And then finally, we're going to take a front end, description of the front end we want, you know, what colors we want, and so on, how we want it to be laid out, and we're going to generate code from that. And I've grayed this out because that bit we haven't actually uh, implemented yet. And then finally, all of this simply gets wrapped together in a completely mechanical way uh, and deployed to the web. So the crucial idea here is, the, is a very non-standard structuring of the web app, which is that each of these individual concepts gets its own file. So the post concept, for example, has a file containing the actions and the database representing the structure of posts. And notice, importantly, that these concepts have no dependencies on one another. The links are only these vertical links. The only relationship between these concepts is in the roots that synchronize the concepts together. So let me just show you, um, this, is the, um, this is the application builder that Abu Talib has, has created. And in short, this is what you see when you open it up. And you can see there are already some concepts there because there are, there's a concept of a user and a concept of a web session, which you just assume everybody wants. You can delete them if you don't like them. Then what you do is you basically list your concepts. For each concept, you, um, you give a brief description. So here, for example, is a description of karma. You just say, this is in, this four lines just describes what, what karma is. And you give that very vague and minimal description, and it generates uh, the code for you. So here's the code that it generates. It extracts from the code the specification. Here's the specification. You then give what's called uh, the route. Here's the route description. It says, uh, I want a, an HTTP post, register and login. New users start with one karma point. That's all it is. And from that, it generates the code from that. And with all these things, um, we have essentially the full functionality of Hacker News. And so here's what it looks like. Um, we called it Hacked News. Um, and essentially, it replicates all the behavior um, that, that Hacker News has, including this rather bizarre one that you can change the color of the top bar. Who knows why they wanted that? So what's good about this is that you can basically build this whole application by providing only about 1,000 words of informal specification, about 100 lines. Um, and it works basically the first time. And it also includes the ability to have nested comments. The bad things, we don't yet have the front end built automatically, um, but we're on the way to that. And sometimes um, the, the things you actually have described are a little intricate, but they're intricate normally because the actual behavior is intricate. So this basically describes Hacker News' strange rules for how you actually order the things on the home page. So three takeaways. Takeaway number one, and I think this is actually true of all uses of LLM, M structuring the task is key, and in the case of code, that means that modularity is key. And this idea of breaking the function into concepts gives you huge leverage because they're independent, which means that you can build them separately, and then you can also reuse them. The second takeaway is that if you can factor out the familiar parts, separate, for example, the notion of comments and posts, from the weird stuff that Hacker News does, like with its rules about karma points and how many karma points you need to do a downvote and that kind of stuff, then you can have concepts that are completely standard and can be reused and can be easily built by GPT and then separate into a much smaller part of code, the tricky bits. And then the final thought, which I think is kind of intriguing to me, is that I think we're at a point where we're saying goodbye to agile programming. You know, agile was this big cool thing and what the agilistas told us, their mantra was, Forget all that time wasted with design and specification and requirements. Just write code, because that's what your customers want. Forget everything else. And now with GPT, what we should be telling everybody is, forget the code. GPT can do that. Spend all your time on the design and the specification, because that's where the real human value is. And finally, I can't resist ending with a shameless plug uh, for my book. John's preventing me from doing this by standing in front of the <laughs> thing. There you go. Uh, so this is my book, and it explains the whole idea of concepts uh, and how you can think about uh, all the applications you know in terms of the concepts they're composed of. Thank you.